we're in the Thompson Bank um, here at Old Sturbridge Village. And banks in the early 19th century were pretty much set up as commercial ventures. Their business was to make short-term commercial loans to, um, to establish businesses. They're usually started by entrepreneurs, by businessmen who needed liquid capital, who needed working capital. So they would organize um, and petition the state legislature for an act of incorporation. Uh, they were usually capitalized at around $100,000, and um, they got their money not from deposits, but by shareholders, usually $100 shares. And these, these banks were not in every town by a long shot. Most towns didn't have them. In fact, in the, at the uh, time of the American Revolution, there were no banks in the United States. They grow as the country grows, as to what we call today the economy um, grew, and the need for working capital became increasingly apparent. So businessmen organized so that when they needed it, it would be there, and when they didn't need it, their money could be working for them um, and make them more money. The way the banks worked was businessmen who needed uh, a capital for a short term, like say a printer has books to publish, gets a contract to publish, say 10,000 copies of the New Testament, um, wants, to, um, wants to do that, but in order to do that, he needs the money to buy paper, to buy ink, to buy type, to hire workmen, um, to actually print the books. And so what he does is goes to a bank, explains that he has this contract, that he has this going concern, the bank asks him what he can put up as collateral, might be his printing press, his fonts of type, um, might be personal property, um, uh, house, wagons, whatever. And um, the, the bank cashier, the sole employee of the bank, um, would take this information and then when the bank president and the board of directors meet periodically, they review applications for loans and those that are deemed a good risk would receive the loan. The loan is not given in hard metal currency, the only legal tender of the day, but it's issued in the notes, the paper money printed by the bank. And the notes are only as good as the bank that prints it. Like a check, it's only as good as whoever's behind it. It's not guaranteed by the government or anything other than that uh, privately owned state chartered bank. And the bank issues the three month loan at a lawful rate of 6% interest. That was what the state allowed to be charged. Um, and the bank would discount the loan. In other words, take the interest off the top. So give less than the full amount, say $500, but expect the full amount to be paid off in three months. And by issuing their own notes, they're hoping those notes go into circulation. That, if we continue the analogy of the printer, that he's going to use these notes to buy paper, to buy type, to buy ink, to pay his employees, who are then going to use it to buy things they need. And hopefully these things stay in circulation. Because as long as somebody doesn't bring the note back to the bank and say, I want hard money, silver coin, gold coin, to the value of this note, it's like writing a check now that never, that never gets cashed. It doesn't get deducted from your account. So yeah, the bank makes money with this um, charging interest on the loan, but by keeping the notes in circulation, they're making even more money. And they're able to issue more notes than they have in reserves to a certain legally established percent so that they, they can um, make more money that way. So basically, they're lubricating the wheels of commerce by being in existence. Um, one of the problems with that was that a lot of people didn't understand how it worked. Um, they distrusted the fact that these rich people are making money out of nothing when they've got to sweat out in the hot sun and sometimes not even get the full value for their money because the bank note might not be genuine or the bank note might be genuine but the bank by the time they get to redeem it has gone out of business and the paper is not worth anything and that grows resentment. Counterfeiting was common and um, yeah counterfeiting was common because a lot of people didn't see anything more illegal to counterfeiting than what banks were doing. Mm -hmm. Taking worthless paper and saying this is worth money and if somebody accepts a note whether it's genuine or not does it matter if it's counterfeit? It's still cash in circulation. Um, to make it, to, to have merchants have a way of dealing with counterfeiters, various publishers would publish monthly magazines called counterfeit detectors. This one was published by a man named Robert Bicknell out of Philadelphia, but there were others. And he would have a list of every bank in the country 
and what state it was in, whether not only what, what political entity, New Jersey, Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, whatever it was in, but also what state the bank was in in terms of a business. In other words, whether the bank was solid or whether it had been found as failed, had gone out of business and the notes were worth nothing. Or if the, the notes were circulating and the bank was shaky and you should discount them. In other words, maybe give 90 cents on a dollar, not full value, full face value of the note. Um, and so you could look that up in a counterfeit detector, but you could also look up things about the note that might not be quite legitimate, might not be kosher. That, you know, the, the signature is, is blurry on the fake note, or the, or the Indian's headdress is lacking feathers on the right side, or something like that. Of course, counterfeiters were clever. They usually would all, they'd often then work out of Canada, so the government couldn't touch them. The federal government didn't really care about counterfeiters because it's not their money being counterfeited. The states didn't really care. It was if the private banks tried to get the state legislatures to you know, enforce this in the state uh, legal system to, pro to catch and prosecute counterfeiters, then it happened. But, uh, and it did happen periodically, but you didn't have the Secret Service running around trying to catch them because there was no Secret Service. There were no federal monies. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to ask when did when did our country adopt a, a uniform coinage? We adopted a uniform coinage um, in the uh, in the 1780s with the Constitution. Um, we're the first country to have a decimal coinage. We still today in the 21st century don't go for a decimal measuring system, but we were the first country to ever go to decimal monetary system with a dollar divided into 100 parts and dimes, the one-tenth of a dollar, and um, having a very logical, as opposed to the, the pound, shilling, and pence. And the old pound, shilling, and pence doesn't have any sense. It makes no more sense than inches and yards and miles in terms of units of measurement. What about paper money? Paper money is something that the United States did during the American Revolution. And we learned our lesson. Um, the Continental Congress during the American Revolution to finance the war printed a whole lot of paper money. And the individual states printed a whole lot of paper money. Every time state governments or the Continental Congress needed money, they print money. And there was so much out there in circulation that it wasn't worth anything. There came to be a saying, not worth a Continental. The money wasn't worth anything anymore. And so um, when they or reorganized from the Articles of Confederation to the um, the federal constitution we're still under. The federal government took the sole right to coin money, but the federal government didn't print paper money anymore. They knew it was just asking for trouble. Because there wasn't enough precious metal, the only legal tender, um, silver, gold, copper coins, um, out there for all the business people needed to do, and you couldn't do everything on book credit where you're, you're writing down, I owe you this, you owe me that, and balancing debts and credits on paper. That works when you're face to face. It doesn't work when you're out traveling and dealing business with strangers on a transitory basis. That's where you need cash, holding your hand money, either bank notes that most people will take, kind of like most people will take an American Express traveler's check, even though they don't have to. It's a private company. Yeah. Bank notes people would usually take if they thought the bank was good, especially if they could look it up and check. Um, but that, that degree of liquidity made commerce go more smoothly. Let people more easily buy and sell stuff. Um, but the federal government realized it was risky to do paper money. So until the dramatic emergency of the Civil War, they didn't print paper money. They printed paper money during the Civil War. And when the war was over, they did as much as they did everything they could to buy back those notes, paying gold and silver out so that we didn't have this inflation-prone paper money floating around. Um, if the silver supply expanded, then money could be devalued because the price of silver was less and that's you're based on that. And in the late 18th, 1800s, there was the debate whether you base your money on gold or silver and William Jennings Bryan across a gold speech, but that's far in my future, as it were. So but that's what the banks were about. It's mostly making cash available for, for businessmen to keep doing more business, to concentrate money so people could make more money, to put it short. No checking accounts, no savings accounts, no no, um, no bank loans for buying a new wagon or buying a house. If you wanted to borrow money to buy a house, to buy a, to buy a blacksmith shop, you could go to somebody with money and say, do you want to make some money by loaning me money to buy this? I'll pay you 6% interest. And a lot of times when people went to sell property, they knew the only way they could sell it is if they held the mortgage. 
In other words, gave people a year, two years, five years to pay. Most mortgages now, in 2013, are for 20, 30 years. Back in the early 1800s, most mortgages for a year, three years. I've seen one that went for 10 years. Um, the man who owned that big white house there, General Salem Town, um, owned money, o owed, excuse me, loaned money to a blacksmith to buy a blacksmith shop. And he gave it for 10 years, a so 6% interest. Um, but uh, except for that, most mortgages I've seen are for one to three years, the occasional five-year mortgage, and just that one 10-year mortgage. So. Can you explain inflation? And is it the same principle as today? Yeah, pretty much it's the same principle as today. Basically, you have the law of supply and demand. And if there's a lot of something more than people want it, you know, then the value goes down. So, so if, there's, if there's too much money in circulation, then the value goes down. Deflation is when there's, um, there's something very limited and the value goes up. So, uh, it, it, so basically, when you've got hard currency, it's hard to have the runaway inflation that you can have with paper money. Just with gold and silver coins being the basis of the currency, they can't that dramatically increase the gold or silver supply. Even if they find a new mine somewhere, it's not going to flood the market the way you can flood the market with paper money. It's not worth anything. So if there's if there's a hundred dollars around in this room, and you know if I buy that bottle of water from you for one dollar, and you know we exchange the money back and forth, then we've got a system of what things are worth. But if suddenly somebody throws in five hundred more dollar bills in the window. There's the same number of us, there's the same number of bottles of water, what's going to happen to the price of the bottles of water? Right. Right, exactly. But if at the same time there's that hundred dollars and dollar bills blowing around, I've got them on the counter, and a wind comes up, blows them out, same number of us, same numbers of bottles of water, what's going to happen to the dollar value of the bottle of water? Because we have less money to deal with. So that's a very simplified version, but you know. So okay, well, that's good. <laughs> sure. Well, it's almost time, the walrus said, so I should pack up my cares and woes here and head down with you guys.